some of you are, and maybe some of you are going uh, or are in a PhD program or want to be in a PhD program. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about um, structuring an argument in general and an economics argument in particular. And we're going to do that using something known as the CARS model, which you may or may not have heard of. But I'll, I'll introduce and, and talk that to you and talk to you about that. Then we're going to talk about four principles of clear writing um, that I uh, believe in very strongly for the kind of writing for, for the kind of writing that you're probably going to be doing, which is well for academic expository nonfiction writing. I think these principles are very very helpful, and then we'll then we'll then we'll do a, a review. So let's talk about a mindset for writing. And, and the first thing I wanna say is that you should think of writing as a lifelong pursuit, as something that you're gonna spend the rest of your career developing, getting better at, those kinds of things. Um, no one workshop, no one book, no one class is going to solve all of your problems. They will help, uh, they can help, but, um, there will always be room for improvement. There will always be more things to learn. Um, I used to teach a writing intensive undergraduate course at Duke University. And I was amazed at how many students would come into my office and say, I wanna meet with you for 30 minutes and get my writing problem solved for once and for all. <laughs> and it's like, well, we all would love to do that. You know, <laughs> that's just not the way it not the way it works. Um, writing is very much like learning to play a musical instrument. Um, it takes practice, it's often painful, um, and there's, there's always room for improvement. Uh, one book that you're gonna hear me talk about in this, uh, in this presentation is by a woman named Helen Sword. And Professor Sword has spent her career researching and writing about academics as writers. And her latest book is uh, a book called Air and Light and Time and Space. And it's about the habits that successful academic writers develop in order to get writing done. And one of those habits is the artisanal, artisanal habit. And uh, that refers to what I was just talking about, which is thinking of writing as this skill that you are going to commit your professional life to, to working on and, and getting better on. And that's, that's, that's one of the things successful academic writers do is they, they think of writing as a lifelong pursuit that they're always working on. So that's the first thing I wanna say. Second thing I wanna say is everybody, and I mean everybody, struggles with writing. So if you're worried that your writing is no good or you can't figure out what you want to say or you know, anything like that, you are not alone. Everybody struggles with it. Everybody struggles with it. There's a famous composition teacher, American composition teacher named Peter Elbow. Um, he basically invented the field of composition studies back in the 60s and 70s. And he says that if you scratch an academic, you'll find someone in trouble with writing. And, and what that means is that for every academic just below the surface, there's some writing project that's giving them a lot of trouble <laughs> you know, that, they're, that they're struggling with. Um, I mentioned Helen Sword just a, a few moments ago. And um, you know, she's interviewed hundreds of academics about writing, writing as an academic. And every one of them, even if they've published books and articles and are, are, are at the top of their career, they almost always feel insecure and apologetic about their writing. You know, they all think that they don't write very well, that, you know, why are you interviewing me? I, don't, I have no style, you know. <laughs> so everybody, everybody struggles with this and everybody feels insecure about their writing to, to one degree or another. So given the fact that um, I would like you to think of writing as a lifelong pursuit and given the fact that uh, you're no doubt struggling with it, just as we all are. 
um, what, what can you do? Well, let me offer you a, a few things. And the, uh, the first thing I wanna offer you is, uh, I want you to start thinking of yourself as a writer. Now you probably think of yourself as an economist or um, an academic of some kind. You probably have other identities that you, uh, for yourself, that you think of yourself as. You probably don't think of yourself as a writer. So I want to encourage you to start thinking of yourself as a writer, um, because guess what? You are. <laughs> you are and you're going to be if you're serious about getting into any kind of academic field. If you're serious about changing the world, you're going to have to be a writer. So uh, the sooner you accept this identity, I think the better things are going to be for you. So wh why do I say this? Well, so I really like trees. And what I've noticed is when I learn how to identify a tree, I suddenly see it all over the place, whereas before I never noticed it. And I think the same, the same thing happens when you start thinking of yourself as a writer. So you start paying attention to writing in a way that you probably never have before. You start reading things, not just for what they say, but for how they say it. So you'll find yourself asking yourself, gee, why does the author start this way? Why is the literature review organized like this? The author just told me she found three things or one of these more important than the other. And if so, why didn't she tell me? So you start reading as a writer. And when you start doing that, you start noticing things about writing that I think you didn't notice before and that I think will help you become a better writer. Um, you'll also start finding writing lessons in places where you didn't find them before. So if you start thinking of yourself as a writer, you're probably going to start noticing announcements for writing workshops and writing groups and things like that that you may not have noticed before. You may notice when someone talks about writing, you're suddenly going to be listening, whereas in the past you may not have listened before. I think all of these things happen when you start thinking of yourself as, as a writer. Um, how many of you are familiar with this? Uh, mag it's not really a magazine, it's more substantial than that, but it's called the Paris Review. It's been around for, for a long time now. The, the Paris Review is famous for their interview series with authors, poets, novelists, um, short story writers, and now they're starting to interview nonfiction writers. They're starting to interview essayists and people like that. And these, in the course of these interviews, they almost always talk about writing and their writing process. And it's fascinating to, to read about how even the best writers, even the best writers, writing is such a slow and difficult process uh, for them. That um, they're really fascinating to read. There is um, something in the in the U.S. called the Chronicle of Higher Education, which is basically it's it's the main sort of newspaper for higher ed in the United States, and they have a series of interviews with academics talking about writing. So I encourage you to look those up as well. And, and see, see what your fellow academics are saying about their own writing practices, their own struggles with writing, all those kinds of things. So, um, you know, start thinking of yourself as a writer. And I think you're going to start seeing writing lessons and looking at writing in different ways that are going to be helpful to you. Um, so that's the first thing to do. Given the fact that writing is a lifelong pursuit and it's a struggle, what can you do about that? I think the first thing is start thinking of yourself as a writer. Um, the second thing is I would look for a routine that works. Now, I, I use the routine with a little bit of hesitation because some of you may actually do better without a routine. But I think most people need some kind of routine in order to get any kind of writing done. And uh, what I encourage you to do is to experiment and find a routine that works for you. Um, this may be something that you measure in time. 
I'm going to write for one hour every morning, or I'm going to write for 30 minutes every afternoon, or whatever it might be. This could be something that you measure in words. I'm going to write 300 words a day. You know, um, the, the, the point is to experiment and see what works for you at this particular time with the particular writing projects that you're, that you're currently dealing with. Um, and the point I want to emphasize with a routine is um, kind of what I was getting at with the free writing, and that is doing something, no matter how small, is a lot better than doing nothing at all. And that's true when it comes to writing. You know, my ninth grade math teacher, she would say to me, she would say to me, Paul, you can overcome an F, but you can't overcome a zero. And she was right. You can't overcome a Z, you know, it, like an F is so much better than a zero. Um, writing even a hundred words is so much better than writing nothing at all. Um, so um, I, encur I encourage you to, to, to look for a routine that, that works for you um, as a way of getting words down on a page. The, the third thing that I suggest um, is um, a turn to your community. So um, you might, for example, there's a lot of you out there. You're all writing, you're all struggling with writing. Uh, you may want to form or join what's known as a writing group. Now, writing groups have been used for years by creative writers, short story writers, novelists, people like that. Academics are now starting to use writing groups for their academic writing. Um, in fact, we, ha we have one at the research center that I work for at Duke. We have a writing group we meet every Monday. Um, and these writing groups can be used for any number of purposes, uh, motivation, accountability, feedback, community, a combination of all of those. Um, so part of your community might be forming or joining what's known as a, as a writing group. And if you look up writing group online, you can find lots of resources that tell you how these groups might be structured and what they do and, and those kinds of things. Um, another way to turn to your community is um, to ask colleagues to read your writing and to give you feedback on your writing. Now, this happens all the time. This is something that academics just do. Um, some of you might be from cultures where that's you're kind of you're 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 not really comfortable doing that. Um, but I can tell you, at least in the American, British, European culture, uh, this is a very common practice. Very common practice. Um, you you ask someone to read what you've written and to provide comments. Now. Having said that, you need to meet them halfway, okay? So what you ask them to read should be sufficiently developed. I mean, no one wants to read just your rambling notes on a subject, okay? They're, that's not, they're not gonna wanna read that. They're gonna read something that's a little more developed than that. Um, you might help them by asking for specific kinds of feedback. So you may say, hey, can you pay particular attention to my introduction and tell me what you think my main argument is after reading it? You know, so you might ask them for specific pieces of feedback to help them guide their reading so they know what you're looking for. Um, but you know what? You don't even have to give them anything to read at all, really. You can just talk about a writing project, and that can be extremely helpful. So don't don't overlook that fact either. You know, here's what I'm trying to do. You know, this is what I'm. These are the problems I'm running into. This is what I'm going to do next. You know, sometimes talking through a, a project can be can be very very helpful. So turn to your community. Think of yourself as a writer. Find a routine that works. Turn to your community. Um, but most of all. I want you to be kind and gentle to yourself. So 
what you're trying to do is really, really hard. Okay, it's real, and we don't acknowledge that enough. All right, we don't, we, we don't. And if you're in graduate school, you know, I don't have to tell you that graduate school can be really tough on your emotional and mental well being. And if you've ever attended an economics presentation where someone presents a paper, um, they can get pretty nasty pretty quickly because because the, the 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 norm is three or four minutes into your presentation, people are going to start interrupting you with questions, and they're going to be kind of accusatory. They're you know the, the, they're going to be questions that suggest you left something out or or doing something wrong or something like that. So. They can be really tough. So the point is that there's going to be a lot of people out there who are going to give you a hard time, <laughs> whether they intentionally want to do that or not. That's just how they're going to come across. Don't you be one of them. <laughs> be your own best ally. Um, so uh, be kind and gentle to yourself. On that note, I do want to recommend two books, one of which I've already mentioned, and that's the book by Helen Sword called Air and Light and Time and Space. And what she does is she discusses five habits that successful academics cultivate, I'm sorry, four habits that successful academics cultivate in order to be successful writers. And two of those habits are social habits and emotional habits, okay? So be good to yourself. The other book I want to recommend is something called um, The Elements of Academic Style, Writing for the Humanities by a literature professor named Eric Hyatt. And in this book, I especially want to call your attention to part one, which is on writing as a practice, and part four, which is on becoming a writer. I think both of these books are are good companions for you as you try to do something that's uh, that's very, very difficult. Let me pause for just a moment and see if there are any questions. I'm going to open the chat and let's see. Um, if you have any questions, uh, I'll pause for just a moment to, to, to answer them. Paul, I have a question that might yeah. help us. Um... I'm curious, how did you get into or interested in talking and teaching writing in the first place? That's not, a, not a, a, the usual path for an academic uh, economist or somebody interested in this field. How did you gravitate towards this? So I've been a, um, I, I got into, I, I went to graduate school in English at the University of Wisconsin and I got into editing. And after I finished my master's degree, I started as an editor at, um, at a research institute at Wisconsin. And that's how I got into it. When I, when I moved to Duke to work for a Duke press journal, the editor of the journal taught was in the economics department. And he taught a lot of writing intensive classes. And he started getting me involved in those classes. And that's kind of how it all started. So I started teaching, helping him teach writing intensive classes. And then I was the tutor, the writing tutor for the department for a while. Um, and, and it just has sort of continued from there. So that, that's how it all started. Um, yeah, but thanks for that question. I appreciate it. Other, other questions? Okay, I'm gonna move on then. Um, so now I've just talked to you about what I called a mindset for writing, you know, ways to think about yourself and to think about writing that, that I hope will be helpful in, in getting you to put words on a page. Uh, what I wanna talk about now is, um, I guess, writing, um, writing itself, and constructing an argument in general and constructing economics arguments in particular. Um, so one, one classic way to construct 
any argument, regardless of the field uh, or even probably the purpose, is you, you begin with something that everyone can sort of agree on, you know, so you kind of bring everybody in and say, well, this is what we can all agree on, or this is what we all generally accept. That's the first step. Then you kind of complicate that. But you know what we don't know, or even though we know this, we're having trouble with that. So that's the second step. You bring them in, remind them of what they already know, then complicate that picture. And then the third step is you offer a solution to that complication. And that's, that's generally how you construct an argument in, in really in, in all kinds of fields and in and, and all kinds of settings. Um, and that I think is true for economics articles. And I'm gonna try to demonstrate that uh, over the next few minutes. So first of all, I know that you all want to change the world and, and remake economics from the ground up, and I hope that you do. But if you want to get an article published, you can have far more modest goals. That's good news for you. <laughs> so most economics articles um, basically are working on the margins of what's already been done. That's what they do. So what they will do is they will make a small but meaningful change to what someone has already done. That's what most of them do. They don't reinvent the wheel. They don't offer a completely new paradigm or anything like that. They take something that's already been done and they change it in some small but meaningful way. So there, there's a there's a, there's a guy named Robert Solo who won the Nobel Prize for his work in growth theory. And Solo once said that economists are little thinkers. And he meant that as a compliment. <laughs> and this is what he was getting at. This is what economists do. They, they kind of tinker on the margins. They make small but meaningful changes to what's, um, to what's already been done. Now, um, what you need to do is new, but it can't just be new. It has to matter. And that's an important element to this. So I once read a whole bunch of papers by uh, a group of scholars, and basically the case that they made for their paper in every case was no one's done this before. Okay. Well, um, that's, that's a good start, but you need a little more than that. Okay, it's not, it can't be just because no one's done this before. It's got to be, this is what I'm doing new, and this is why in its own small little way it matters. And that's what you got to do. So when you, when you listen to economists talk about papers, they generally talk about two things uh, very early on. They talk about what they call the motivation for the paper, and they talk about the contribution of the paper. You know, so they'll ask the presenter, what's your motivation or what's the contribution of the paper? And uh, what do they mean by those two things? Well, they, they can overlap. The, the motivation and the contribution can be kind of the same thing. But a lot of times they're, they're, they're a little different. So I think of the motivation for the paper as the reason why normal people might find the paper interesting. So, um, you know, this, this will, this, this, speaks to the, the size or the urgency of the subject or the problem to the larger society, those kinds of things. Things that you know the, the, the typical person out there might be interested in. That's, that's what I think of as the motivation. Um, the size of the problem, the urgency of the problem, how the problem affects society, those kinds of things. The, the contribution I tend to think of as what economists find interesting about a paper. And so uh, these are usually technical aspects of the paper that economists only can geek out on. That's usually what the, the contribution is. So just to give you an example, let, let's say you were writing a paper about um, the returns to a college degree, right? How much more money do people make if they get a college degree as opposed to if they only graduated from high school? Well, things like the fact that lots of people go to college, Higher ed is a billion dollar industry. The earnings differential is large. 
We spend all this money on grants and student loans and things like that. Those things might be the motivation for the, for the paper, right? Those are things that the person on the street out there is going to be interested in. The contribution might be, oh, I have this new data set that allows me to better estimate a variable than we have before. That's what economists are going to be interested in, <laughs> is that part right there. That's, that's what they would think of as the contribution to the paper. So, um, you know, when you're talking about academic economics articles, small but meaningful change to what's already been done. Uh, motivation, what's the size of the problem? What's the urgency of the problem? Uh, how does the problem affect society in general? And then contribution is typically the technical aspect of the paper that an economist will get really interested about. <clears throat> That's how I think of those three things. Every economics paper is in conversation with the literature. So the literature is simply other academic papers on your subject. That's what the literature is. And, um, you know, one of your tasks when you write an economics paper is to explain as clearly as possible how your paper differs from the literature and why that difference matters. Again, it's not enough just to be different from the literature. Um, after all, there may be a reason no one has done this before. Maybe it's not worth doing. You know, maybe it doesn't get at an important question in the field. So it's got to be how it's different from the existing literature and why that difference matters. Okay. I don't see anything in the chat, so I'm going to continue. Um, let me just check my time here. Okay, we're doing good. Okay, so what I want to talk to you about now is um, how you, this is really about how you construct an argument in an economics paper or really any social science paper. And this is something that you typically do in the introduction to these papers. And, and what I want to present to you is what's known as the CARS model. And CARS stands for creating a research space. And it was identified by this guy named John Swales, who studied hundreds of social science papers to see how they're put together, how they make an argument, those kinds of things. And this is what he came up with. This is what he noticed time and time again, what these papers typically do. And he and his colleague, Christine Feek, um, have a very nice book that I recommend called Academic Writing for Graduate Students that goes into the CARS model and lots of other things about, about writing and how, how academic writers signal important things in their papers, you know, the, the words that they typically use, the phrases that they typically use, where certain things typically appear, those kinds of things. So I highly recommend, recommend their book. So let's, let's talk about the, the CARS model. Um, what I'm gonna suggest to you is that you master the CARS model and then expand it and adapt it for your purposes uh, as you see fit. Um, that's what I'm suggesting that you do is to, to learn this model and then get comfortable with varying the model as your circumstances require. So what are the, what are the three, the, the, the CARS model has three moves, three moves. And the first move is you establish a research space. This is sort of where the CARS acronym comes from. And basically what this is, is you introduce your topic and you give some indication as to why we should care about this topic. So again, this gets at the motivation of the paper. Um, why, why the subject is of importance, how large is the subject, how urgent is the subject, those kind of things. That's what you typically do in, in the first move of, 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 a, uh, of the CARS model. And this is what typically happens in an economics paper. You know, this is how they start off a lot, in a lot of cases. Second thing you want to do is you want to identify a gap or a problem in the literature. Remember, these papers are 
in conversation with the literature out there. And what that means is that the literature identifies problems that need to be solved or addressed. And your paper is gonna solve or address one of those problems. Uh, that's one thing to understand about academic writing in general is academic writing doesn't necessarily respond to problems as society defines them. They respond to problems as their fellow peers, their fellow academics define them. So they're, they're, they're responding to problems in the literature. Now, those, those may coincide with problems in the wider society, but not necessarily. I mean, think about a methodological paper, right? A paper that's about methodology. That's gonna respond pretty much exclusively to what the literature says is a problem. Um, so second move of this CARS model is you wanna identify some kind of gap in the literature, some problem that you know, we, we need to solve in order to, to understand better what we're trying to understand. Um, that's the second move. And then the third move is now that you've identified this gap, the expectation, and you need to fulfill this expectation, the expectation is that you offer a solution to the problem or you fill in the gap in the literature. And that's the third move of, of an economics introduction is to to fill the gap or to solve the problem. Um, that's the CARS model. And that's the way the vast majority of economics papers and social science papers in general, that's how they begin. That's how they set up an argument. And I suggest that you master this and, and then adapt it for your purposes. So let's look at an example. Um, I can't believe I came across this because it's as, if the, it's as if I called the authors up and said, hey, can you write a paper that demonstrates the CARS model? <laughs> you know? um, because this paper that I just pretty much randomly came across um, is just demonstrates the CARS model to a T. Um, the introduction is three paragraphs long. Each paragraph corresponds to what I see as a move in the CARS model. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is just a great example to illustrate what I've been talking about. So in the first paragraph, they establish a research space. They introduce their subject and make a case for why it's worth paying attention to. And they do that with such things as there is a growing concern. <laughs> and this concern has fueled a rich theoretical literature. So they're trying to tell you lots of people are worried about this. And lots of people, at least in the theory world, are paying attention to this. So we think this is worth our attention and our time. That's what's going on in this, in this first paragraph. Move one of the cars model. Second paragraph, they identify a gap. So what they're saying is we have all this great theoretical literature on algorithms and discrimination. But when we try to test these theories, when we try to bring this to an empirical study, we keep running into this problem. We keep running into this selection problem, right? That's what keeps happening here. Um, that's, that's the gap or the problem that, that, that they're identifying here in this second paragraph, corresponding to the second move of the CARS model. We got all this great theoretical literature, more and more people are looking at this. Lots of people are concerned about it, but when we try to do empirical studies of this, we keep running into this selection problem. Notice that I have circled the word however, and the reason I circled that word is because that's often the word that's used to signal the problem. <laughs> you know? So that's a very important word to, to, to have in your toolkit there is, is this word however. And this is the kind of stuff Swales and Feet uh, talk about in their book, you know, they, they will tell you these are the words that that academics typically use to signal certain things. And then the the third paragraph is the third move where they propose a solution to the gap or problem. So the second paragraph they've identified this problem. 
immediately as a reader, my expectation is that now I'm going to hear them tell me how they're going to solve that problem. And that's exactly what they do in the third paragraph. They tell us how they're going to get around the selection problem. Um, so um, this, this particular paper, I think, is a, is a very good example of the CARS model. Um, so um, make sure you, you look at this and study it and, and, and try to, try to uh, understand how it's put together, how they make the moves that they make, and, and all those kinds of things. Um, questions or comments about this? So th this paper is from the American, uh, a, a um, particular journal that the American Economic Association puts out called Papers and Proceedings. And what the Papers and Proceedings issues contain are the papers that were presented at the last American Economic Association meeting. These papers are typically short, five or six pages long. And so they offer really nice compressed models of what an economics paper looks like. So I encourage you to browse through an issue or two of the papers and proceedings so you can start getting a sense using these small manageable models of what an economics paper looks like. And then, you know, once you understand that, you can figure out how you can expand it for, for your purposes into a more full length paper. All right, questions or comments about any of this? Hi, Paul, can you mm -hmm. hear me? I can hear you, yes. Hi, <laughs> um, I have a, a question. I just want to find out, um, okay, there's kind of two things. One is you mentioned a lot of the time that, um, you know, we're in conversation with the literature a lot of the time. So that makes me sort of want to find out like how, how do you think about then your literature review? Is it just, are you just literally saying these people said this and found this, or is there more to it that you are like, are, are trying to say within that literature review? Because then I'm assuming that like in, for example, in your analysis section, you'll be referring back to the literature review saying, well, I found this, which is different from what these people found. Is that the way you're supposed to think about it? And the second thing is in this uh, example that you've given, they say that, you know, th this concern has fueled a rich theoretical literature, but then they cite only two papers. So like, I have a tendency um, to want to, like, I'll be like, okay, there's like, Say, you know, if I say that there's, you know, several people have said this, I want to cite those several people. So I'll try and find like a large amount of literature and have this like long <laughs> citation. But is like, yeah, how do we think about that? Is it okay to just cite like a few maybe relevant or prominent papers on the subject? Um, or do you select maybe just the, like, for example, there's some papers where they themselves, uh, their paper is just a review of the literature and you can cite that one and that's enough. Those are the two sort of questions that I have. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you. Um, those are great questions. Um, let, me, let me answer the second one first. The expectation is that you not cite every single paper that exists on, on the topic. You do want to be selective. And you, and you and what you will start to learn as you study your subject more and more is that there are certain papers that are considered canonical, like, like they're the top papers on this particular subject. And, and usually those, those can suffice. Um, certainly if, if there is a full-blown literature review on your subject, you can cite that and that can stand for you know, a whole host of citations. So you, you definitely want to be, want to be selective. Um, I mean, this is exactly the kind of question you should ask as a writer is you're, you're totally right. They refer to this rich literature, but they have only two citations. And the question is, are these two articles like the, like the really two top articles that everyone knows about and, and sort of 
say the most about this particular subject? We don't know. I mean, I don't know enough about this literature to know, but, but that's exactly the kind of question that you should be asking. Um, and then in terms of the, the literature review itself, okay, so every economics article is gonna have a literature review. Sometimes that literature review will be in the introduction, sort of folded into the intro introduction as part of the introduction. Sometimes if you feel like you need a really long literature review, it'll be in a section of its own, usually right after the introduction. So you'll see it, you'll see it those two ways. Either way, you wanna be selective, okay? The whole point of a literature review is to, or, or one of the main points of a literature review is to make your own contribution stand out. So you want to be discussing what, how other papers treat the particular aspect of your study that you're, that's important to you, but then explain how you do what's different from what they do and why that difference makes, why that difference matters. So when you're, when you're writing your dissertation, part of what you're trying to do is demonstrate to your advisors that you know all this literature. So you probably oversight when you write your dissertation. But once you're past the dissertation stage, you want to get selective. You want to, you, you want to cite um, those works that best contextualize and draw out what's unique about your own paper, what the contribution of your paper is. And then um, within a literature review, you should think about organization. So, you know, you just don't want to willy nilly list a bunch of studies. You know, you might want to organize them chronologically. You might want to organize them thematically. You might want to organize them um, in, in, in terms of what they talk about. Um, try to have some principle of organization that, that is apparent to the reader. And this is where you know your advisor and your colleagues can can really help you is 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 figuring out exactly what to cite and and how to use those citations. Um, yeah, the, the the worst literature reviews, and I've seen them, is one where it's basically just a long list of studies. They'll even like talk about this whenever you talk about a study or a set of studies. I like to always see you end by bringing it back to your own study. Unlike these studies, the present study does X, Y, and Z, or whatever it might be. Rather than just say, study A does this, study B does that, study C does that, and then leave it at that. I, I like to know explicitly how those studies you know, relate to your study. Um, th those are both excellent questions and exactly the kinds of questions that you should be asking. So just so you know, um, um, there, there's a American Economic Association publication called the Journal of Economic Literature, the JEL. Um, I'm gonna type this in the chat. So, so um, That there are article length literature reviews whose sole purpose is to take stock of a body of literature. And you should know about those. If there's one of those on your subject, you should definitely find out about it and read it because those can be enormously helpful. A lot of those things, this is what the Journal of Economic Literature typically publishes. They'll ask some leading authority on a subject to say, hey, write something about the state of the literature, what we know, what we don't know, what are the important studies, what do they do, what do we hope to do next, those kinds of things. So you, you should definitely be aware that, that that kind of article exists out there. And if, and, if, and if one has been written on your subject, that's good news <laughs> because there you have a place where you can go and find out, okay, this is what needs to be done now. This is what people are identifying as important. Jessica? Hey, Paul. Yeah, I just wanted to 
wanted to jump in with a question here myself as well. Um, I think in YSI especially, people are often trying kind of to go beyond the beyond what, what you said solo uh, celebrates, right? Like we recognize this need to go into depth and make, make a specific statement that is rooted in literature, et cetera. But at the same time, we wanna be attached to these bigger societal questions, these sort of massive underlying issues that are, that are all around us. Um, and I wonder if you have any thoughts on how to, how to incorporate that into the work, because I think in this cars model, it might be sometimes a challenge to kind of take those larger concerns and weave them in there. Um, and I wonder if you recommend that we try anyways, or that we pursue other means like, like blog posts, or I don't know, write a book on the side or, <laughs> or do something else with those big questions. I, I, I wonder what you, what you would say to that. Um, I think all of those are perfectly legitimate things to do. So you, there's, there's nothing wrong with having a paragraph in the introduction that says, uh, this study points to larger implications such as, and then you can talk about those. I mean, that you actually see that quite a bit. Or a paper might have a discussion section. Um, so after the, after, after the finding, there will often be a section that's labeled findings and then you'll present your findings. And then these are often followed by a section that's labeled discussion. And that's where some of these things can be brought in, where, where you can talk about the larger implications of what your findings are and what your project is. Um, so yeah, so no, there's actually room for that kind of stuff. All I'm saying is that is that uh, you don't have to do that to get published. Um, and in fact, I don't know if you, in, in the standard academic journals, I don't know if that will get you published. It might, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I I'm think saying, that's part of our struggle. <laughs> what, what I'm saying is that what, an, what, an e, what a published economics article typically does is they take an existing study and they modify it in some meaningful way. That's typically what, what, what you see. Um, Thank you. I think Diana also has a question. Yeah, I'll pass the ball. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. I, I'm, I'm still confused with the literature review. I think it's my uh, weakness because I still don't understand how you use, uh, for example, if you have your, your subject and then you have some methodology which you use like specifically and then a study case, how you organize your literature review. You uh, you start with your subject and then the um, the methodology or the methodology you you put it in the methodology section and then how you manage the the review on the study case. Um, well, I'm still confused with with how you organize this kind of of complex. Yeah. So um, the the. What you often see in a literature review is it, the review will begin by saying something like, this study relates to two strands of the literature, or this study relates to three strands of the literature. <laughs> and then they'll talk about each one in turn. Um, that's, that's, that's one way that these literature reviews are often organized. Now, I, I think what you're asking is, is also where it has to appear. I, I think is that is that one of yes your exactly exactly okay so that really can vary so if you if you look at introductions to economics articles what you're going to notice they all basically have these pieces they introduce the subject they review the literature they state <clears throat> they explain the methodology and they state the findings. They usually have those four, they usually almost always have those four pieces of information. Where those, info, where those pieces of information appear in the introduction and how much space they give to each of those pieces can vary depending on the study. So like if what's really different about your study is the data, you're probably gonna to wanna to spend more time in the introduction on the data than you are on, say, your estimation technique. 
if what's really different about your study is the estimation technique and you're using the same old data that everyone else has used, you're probably going to want to spend a lot more time on the estimation technique and less on the data. Relatedly, when you talk about the literature, if what's different about your study is the estimation technique, then in your literature review, you're going to want to focus on the estimation techniques in the existing literature, the problems with those techniques, and how your technique is going to solve those problems. Does that help? Yes, thank you very much. Just if you have a study case, like specifically, do you mention it or no? If, if you have a study case? Yeah, I mean, if you study like a city. Um, yeah, oh, absolutely. absolutely. No, absolutely. You mentioned those things. You totally mentioned. In fact, look at this, look at this introduction again by Arnold Dobby and Hull. And, and what you'll notice is those four pieces of information I mentioned, they work them all in. Look at the very last sentence of the introduction. We illustrate our approach using data from the New York City pretrial system. So, so even here, they managed to slip in a statement about their data. Um, you know, uh, and, and notice how they specify it's from New York City and that kind of thing. So, no, you definitely want to. You definitely want to do that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's, Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I'm happy to answer more questions. I first want to give you all a five minute break. And then we'll reconvene. So um, it's 1035 where I am. Let's reconvene at 1040 and then we'll continue. All right, so, uh, so take a five minute break, stand up, stretch, all those kinds of things. Sounds good.
Okay, let's uh, let's let's reconvene. Um, right before we took a break, I was talking about <clears throat> articles that are full length articles that are literature reviews. And here's a here's a good example of a full length article that's a literature review um, that's in the latest American Economic Review by David Card, who, who recently won the Nobel Prize. Um, and see if I page through it. Um, he's looking at at models of wage uh, mo models that explain how wages are set, how wages are determined. So he takes you through a brief history, starting with this British economist named Joan Robinson back in the 30s. Um, and then he starts getting into the new theoretical models that develop, it begins with the search models um, and on and on and on. And that's what this, that's what this article is about. Um, and uh, this is an example of the kind of article length literature review that I was talking about. So if you're, if you happen to be working on, you know, mod, wage setting models, this is an article that's going to be very helpful to you. Um, and then at the end, he gets into, Haskett asks about these larger concerns and he gets into this at the end. Um, so he starts asking some normative questions at the end. And he's got an agenda for the future, okay? And uh, he ends by asking, you know, who, who should study wage setting? So he gets into some normative aspects of the, of the subject. Um, so this is just an example of what I was talking about. Um, okay, let me, I wanna stop the share and share a different, I'll go back to my PowerPoint presentation. Okay, um, whoops, how do I get back at the beginning? Um, okay, I'm ready. Okay, um, any, any holdover questions from, from before, before I move on? Okay, so we've talked about the mindset of a writer, lifelong skill, everyone struggles with it. Think of yourself as a writer, develop a routine, seek help from your community, be kind and gentle with yourself. Um, we talked about constructing an argument. So we kind of looked at things from a slightly global perspective. Now I'm gonna bring it down to kind of like the sentence and paragraph level. And I want to show you, um, I want to introduce to you, uh, and let me stress introduce, I want to introduce to you some principles of clear writing that you might find helpful. Um, and uh, uh, these principles are not mine, they can be found either implicitly or explicitly in any number of writing guides, but they are most explicitly discussed in two guides in particular. And I want you to know about these guides. Um, one is called Expectations, Teaching Writing from the Reader's Perspective. And it's by a guy named George Gopin, who, who happens to be a Professor Emeritus at Duke of, of Rhetoric. And uh, I've, I've attended one of his workshops and I highly recommend, if, if, I don't know if he's doing these anymore because he's getting up there. <laughs> but um, if you ever have a chance to attend a George Gopin workshop, you should definitely attend. He's an entertainer and he is extremely good about presenting the principles that he talks about. Um, these, these principles are also uh, explicitly articulated in a book called Style, Lessons in Clarity and Grace um, by uh, Joseph Williams and Joseph Bizzop. Joseph Williams is deceased. He died in 2008. He was a professor of English at Chicago. His co-author, Joseph Bizzop, is a professor of English at Boston University. And these are the books that I recommend. Uh, I've, been, I've been living with these books for a number of years now. Um, 
And I just think they're really, especially the style. Um, expectations can get a little technical, uh, a little, it's, it's kind of a, a, it's a longer book and it's a little more technical, but they, they basically essentially say the same things. Um, and so what I want to, what I want to introduce to you today is um, four principles of clear writing that you find in, in these two books. And I'm going to do this inductively, which is something new for me. So I'm interested to see how this works. I, I'm, I'm still trying to work out how best to discuss and introduce these, these principles. And I'm going to try it inductively today and, and let, let's see what happens. Um, so the first thing I want to do is, okay, I've, I've got two passages here on the screen. And let's suppose that you were writing a passage about the earnings cost of job loss. So, you know, when you lose a job, what happens to your earnings? Which of these two passages seems better given what you want to do, given that you want to write a passage about the earnings cost of job loss. So let me give you a minute or two to look at these two passages and then let me know what you think is the better passage given what you want to do. Okay, Diana says B. Diana, tell me why you think B is the better passage. Um, and Derek also says B. So, Diana, tell me why you think B is the better passage. It's hard to explain, but it's like, it's less emotional. I don't know how to explain that. Like it's more scientific or you don't have the point of view of the uh, authors. I, I don't know, I, I, it's, it's like, seems a little bit more neutral. Okay. Um, Derek, what, what about you? What do you see about B? And Rudolph says B as well. Derek, you wanna tell us why you think B is, um, is better? What about Rudolph? Rudolph, you want to tell us why you think B is better? Um, hello, do you hear me? Yes, I, I can hear you. Oh, perfect. Um, on one side, I like the question uh, that's like addressed to everybody, um, kind of talks to the reader. And secondly, I think on example of the last sentence, I think it's shorter and not so complex. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. So everybody is saying B, and I, I agree. Uh, so your, your instincts are totally right here. Uh, somehow B seems better suited to the purpose, right? Let me just make sure, see if anyone is saying A. Uh, B flows better. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. So here's what I want you to notice, uh, which you probably sensed, but didn't really know to talk about. So what I want you to look at is the grammatical subjects of the sentences. That's what I want you to look at. So if you look at passage A, where's my, there we go. So the grammatical subjects are it, job loss. Well, there's job loss, okay. I, workers, workers, occupation displacement. I don't really see earnings cost of job loss in in that list very often, right? 
Now, if you look at the second passage, look at the subjects of this passage. Earnings cost, the cost, I, cost, earnings cost. The subjects, the grammatical subjects in this passage form a pretty consistent list of, and in that list is the subject of the passage, earnings cost of job loss. That's why passage B is probably better because the grammatical subjects of the sentences name what the passage is about, okay? And so that brings us to the first principle that I wanna to talk to you about today. And that is you wanna make the main character of your story, whatever that person, place, or thing is, the grammatical subject of most or all of your sentences. That's the first principle. Um, now we see this most clearly and most consistently in biographical writing, right? Because, you know, a biography of someone, well, you expect it to mostly be about that someone. So you expect, you know, the grammatical subject, that person to appear in most of the sentences. Here's an example from a, this is a biographical passage from a history of economics article. And you can see the passage is about someone named Simon Nelson Patton. And Patton is the grammatical subject of actually every sentence in this passage. Um, so that's what you need to be aiming for. Um, so the first principle to a clear style is the grammatical subjects of your sentences should name the person, place, or thing that the passage is about. That's, that's what you need to be doing. Um, that's what you need to be doing. So um, questions or comments about this, reactions? So once again, A didn't seem quite as good. I'm suggesting the reason is that the grammatical subjects of these sentences didn't really coincide with what the main subject of the passage was about, whereas in B, they did. Now, there's a question. Let me see what's, what it is. Question. Yes, Rudolph. I wonder, um, because one could say that in the passage that you showed us right now, um, that he repeats, um, like, he also repeats, um, like, uh, except for example, the he, he has it in so many uh, sentences, so that I wonder, um, like intuitively, I would say, this is too much, but, um, or he also repeats patterns so often, and often when I write, I think about, I should change like every sentence and it shouldn't be the same. And here it is different. And that's um, the only thing I want to ask. Um, yeah, what uh, yeah. Point, yeah. No, that, that's, that's a great thing to point out. And I have a lot to say about that. <laughs> um, the, the first thing I want to say, so, so one of the things you're saying is, gee, if I start, if every sentence has the same subject, is my writing going to be monotonous? That's basically what I'm, what I'm hearing you asking. And um, the answer to that is perhaps, could, maybe. Um, but notice in this passage, um, this is not monotonous to me. Notice how every sentence, like, so sentences begin with prepositional phrases. They begin with participial phrases. Um, in fact, there's no sentence that begins with Patton. Every sentence begins with some kind of introductory phrase. Now, um, if I were, you know, perhaps if I were advising the writers here, maybe I would say, hey, why don't you begin one sentence with the subject and not with a prepositional or participial phrase? My, my point is that there's going to be enough other kinds of variation in your writing, I think, to where you don't really have to worry about that. But writing is a trade-off, right? So if you think, gee, this is monotonous, let me start one of these sentences with some other subject, go ahead and do it. 
that's the trade-off you're making. I'm going to have a little less. I, I may, I may be muddling the story just a little bit, but I'm not going to be as monotonous, and that's a trade-off I can live with. That's that's where the art of, of writing comes in. Um, Jay, you have a question. Yeah, thanks. I think this exercise is really good for me. Um, I'm trying to maybe restate what you said in a in a different way, the way I might understand it. Um, getting clear on what you're trying, basically you're, you're establishing a hierarchy, even in the grammar. Um, but what is the what is the most important thing that you're trying to express and trying to make sure that the subjects are the maybe the the centerpiece of every of every sentence? Um, you want to make sure uh, that that's reflected in that. And perhaps the the struggle we have with writing is exactly the clarity of message anyway, right? Because writing is becoming clearer about what you're trying to say, and that's why, you know, when you're writing, you actually trying to find your message, but then also at the same time, at the same time, if your message is not clear, you're struggling with writing, you don't know where, where to start sometimes. So I think um, the fact that you wrote in the, in the previous example, you wrote very clearly what, what, we're, what we're trying to establish and then you gave us an example how two different ways of writing it, that's a very clear, that's a very clear starting point. But perhaps a lot of us are struggling with writing because we're not clear what we're trying to say in the first place. Um, and therefore, these things become muddled because I, when I read, read when I read A, I said that's how I write, and then I said B, um, oh yeah, that could be better. But um, I think it is we're trying we're in search a little bit uh, through iterations what we're actually trying to say sometimes. Um, so I guess I guess uh, that's the first observation. A second quick observation is that um, what you were saying with regard to the previous section was that we want to have very clear sections and functions uh, for the different, the different sections. So the high level, um, very deep and clear, you know, there's a, there's a very clear thesis we're, we're supporting and everything is in service of this thesis or in this case, within a, within a sentence, everything's in service of the subject. Um, but maybe you can speak to that. I was trying to just work through the different parts of what you were trying to say and make sense of it. I was wondering if, if this resonates or not. So you're talking about what I was saying about the cars model and and structuring an argument and and on that level and then how that how that might relate to what I'm saying about the sentence level here or the or the level of the passage. Yeah, exactly. What's the purpose of the literature review? What are you trying to show with literature review? How you are you placing your argument within that review? Then how do you? What is your specific contribution in one sentence? Then how do you support that contribution? So mm -hmm. every every section has a every section has a distinct purpose that we have to understand because we don't if we don't distinguish these purposes and know how they how they serve each other then everything becomes less we have more of a block if you will in writing these things because we're not getting at a very clear purpose of what we're trying to do and it's also maybe clarifying the problem we're trying to solve there's maybe five or six different problems we're trying to solve but maybe the most important to talk about is then what is the contribution we're making or what is the specific thesis we're we're trying to support because then you can actually go in and, and figure it out maybe there's another way but i'm just wondering if that's so when i talk about hierarchy like everything starts with a with your own contribution and where you're placing it and, and so forth so yeah i'm not sure if i'm being clear but I, I was just trying to make sense of what's been said so far yeah um i'm not entirely sure how to how to exactly what the what I may not be entirely sure what your question is um uh, the the thing that you you should let me go back to what you're saying about maybe we're struggling about what we're trying to say right with what we're trying to say um so one question you should be asking yourself as you're writing is what is this passage about what am I what is the subject of what I'm writing about right now and think about making that the grammatical subject of most or all of the sentences. That's one way that you signal to your reader. And this is, this is one of Gopin's expectations. He says, readers expect that the grammatical subject names what the sentence is about. He says, readers will, whatever shows up first, that's what they think the, sub, the sentence is about. 
and usually what shows up first is is the subject. Um, so so that's what you and, and you may not have an answer to what is this passage is about. What is this passage about? You may not have an answer to that yet. So it's you'll 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 eventually come to it through reading and through thinking and through researching. Um, but that's the question you should be asking yourself: is what is this passage about? So in a literature review, it's about this. It's about mainly the, the, the literature. So, so the subject should be these studies um, that, that you're talking about. Um, that's, that's what I would expect. Um, I shouldn't say should, that's what, I would, that's what I would expect it to be in most cases. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm clear. Thanks. Thanks for that answer, Paul. Are, are you? Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, um, well, well, can maybe, I jump maybe, in on that? Yes. Oh, go ahead, Jay. Well, yeah, I was just trying to maybe I think explicitly explicitly express that there is what you're trying to get at is um or what what I what I got from from your contribution is specifically a sentence consists of a hierarchy of of, of information subject is supported by by the active verb and there's other sentence structure that that aids you in the understanding of how these two things interact and therefore you have to be clear about the, the subject and the verb if you will um and then from there start there so the hierarchy what's that at the top of the hierarchy and sort of build, build build from there uh what, what is in support and what is there to, to aid that and if you have a passive sentence or the it for example that doesn't show you anything it's, you have to sort of keep you're guessing yourself as the writer potentially what the it is um and even that then you keep it you, you keep the uh the reader also guessing. So I'm just saying, okay, you're actually clear. You have to become clear in this process of writing what the subject is or what you're trying to say. And that's reflected not only in the sentence structure and the grammar, it's, it was also clear to me a bit more like in the literature review and in the other sections to, to actually be, be clear. There's a, there's a clear function for every, every piece. There's a clear function in the grammar for every, for the subject and for the, the verb and the, and the other pieces. So yeah, that, I guess I'm answering my own question now, but yeah, thanks Paul. Heska, were you trying to get into or was that someone else? Uh, I, I just, yeah, I had a comment on this because I do recognize a lot of what Jay is saying in terms of learning what you're trying to say by attempting to write it down. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in the middle of that just yesterday, uh, you know, <laughs> coincidentally, both Jay and I, we were writing something together with a third person. So then it became a very, um, that process became very apparent. But I wanted to connect it to the free write that you had us do at the beginning and see if you um, if how, how you see those to to relate, because for me, oftentimes, and I wonder if if other people have this, too, I kind of need to go back to like free write mode in order to figure out what I'm saying. So basically, let go of of attempting to say it in a, in a sort of eloquent way and just say it however it comes out <laughs> and then the meaning I, I get to sort of be surprised that oh that's what i'm trying to say now let me go back to put it in the, in a proper sentence so so i uh, maybe uh, you might remember that i said that i'm going to try to uh, I'm, I'm still playing around with how to introduce and talk about these principles and today i'm going to do it inductively i'm now wondering if if inductively is the right way to do it because a lot of the questions you're you're asking i think are ones that would have been answered in the old ways that I used to present this. So, so free writing is all about getting words down on a page. It's all about fluency. It's all about circumventing, working around whatever internal sensor is operating inside you that's telling you you can't write, you know, what you write is no good, you have nothing to say, all that kind of stuff. In fact, I, I came across a quotation from the uh, the famous movie director David Lynch, and 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 basically the quotation was, whenever you hear people telling you you can't write or you're telling yourself you can't write, then write the next sentence. That's how you shut up those those people. Um, so free writing is all about getting words down on a page. These principles are really more about, hmm, okay, people are having trouble understanding what I'm trying to say. I wonder why that is. Um, this might be one of the reasons why. And, and Jay, you, you are actually anticipating some of the other principles I'm going to talk about. So maybe after I talk about all four of them, a lot of the questions that you have will, will have 
will have been will have cleared up in your mind. I don't know, but but um, what what Williams and and Gopin say is that when, when we think we're not communicating, we think it's because we're using the wrong words or we're not saying things in the right way. And that might be the case. But what they say is, no, what you're, what, what's going on is that readers expect or want certain pieces of information to appear in certain places. If you put that information where they expect to find it, then you're gonna greatly increase your chances that you're gonna successfully communicate with the reader. So we can go back to the introduction, right? That we, that we talked about with the CARS model. An introduction comes with certain expectations. We expect the subject to be introduced. All right, we expect to have some kind of indication of why, uh, of the author's argument or what the author's purpose is. And if those things are not given, then we're kind of confused, right? What if an introduction began, in this study, the main finding is blank? Or, or, or the, what if, even better, what if it began, in this study, I use data from such and such? I don't think I've ever seen an economics paper begin that way. If one did, you would go, oh, wait a minute, holy cow, that's not what I was expecting, what's going on here? Um, so, so, you know, a lot, genres and, 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 and kinds of writing bring with them, readers will bring expectations to them. And part of what you need to do in order to communicate effectively is meet those expectations. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. But, but with these principles on the level of the sentence and, and the passage. Um, yeah, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about how school, we're gonna. I think I think all of this is gonna become clearer once we get through these four principles <laughs> um, about about this 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 business about where you put information. Um, so here's what I want you to do. Um, I want you to take a piece of writing, ideally a piece of writing that you're working on right now. If you don't have something you're working on right now, you can take something that you've written recently. Um, but ideally, I, I want you to work on something that you're writing right now. And what I want you to do, get my, hold on a second, is I want you to look at the sentences in that passage. And all I want you to do is underline the simple grammatical subjects in each sentence. And just ask yourself, do these name what this passage is about? And if they do, then great. Um, if they don't, then you may want to think about revising. Um, so that's what I want you to do. I want you to take four or five minutes, look at a passage, you know, maybe about 200 words long, something like that, and underline the grammatical subjects and just ask yourself, gee, do these name what I think this passage is about or what I want this passage to be about? And if they do, then you're on the right track. If they don't, maybe you're not. Um, so take a few minutes to do that and then we'll, and then we'll, we'll reconvene. And whatever, you pa whatever passage you choose, I'm gonna have you do more things to that same passage. So um, just, just so you, 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 you know that.
Okay, one more minute, and then we'll move on. Pesca, are you there? I'm here, yeah. Um, do I have until 12.30 or only until 12? You officially have until 12.30. Okay, that's, that's, what, I was, that's what I was thinking. So, that's okay. what you were wanting? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. To you, no, really. I mean, You're I mean, if, if, if you told me only until 12, I would have made some changes on the fly, but um, okay. No, no, yeah, there's time. Okay, so um, let's move on to the second principle. So I'm gonna, do this just like I did the first one. <laughs> um, so, so just to review, principle one, make your main character the grammatical subject of most of all your sentences. But I do want to pause and go back to an issue that um, Zenzi was getting at. And that's this business about variation. Because I, 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 when, when Rudolph was saying, you know, I'm worried that if I don't vary my sentences, my writing is going to be monotonous. And I saw Zenzi go like that. And so there's good variation and there's bad variation. And knowing the difference is just part of the art of writing, of being a good writer. But I will tell you, so when people think variation, what they tend to think only of is words. That's what they tend to think of. There's all kinds of variation that's going on in a piece of writing. So let's go back to the, these two passages. And this is something that, um, that I think um, Rudolph picked up on. So in the first sentence, these are all declared. So, so one source of variation is different kinds of sentences. So in the first passages, they're all declarative sentences. The second passage, you have an interrogative sentence, you have a different kind of sentence. That's a source of variation, okay? That's a, that's a source of variation. You've got sentences that begin with different kinds of introductory phrases, prepositional phrases, um, participial phrases, and so forth and so on. So my point is that there's all kinds of variation that goes on in writing other than words. And I'm gonna caution you that words are actually the thing that you probably wanna be most careful about varying. Because what happens is there's something called um, elegant variation. Let me just write that in the chat. Elegant variation. And what that means is you use a different word for the same concept every time you refer to the concept. And that's generally a bad idea, especially in academic writing. But you see it all the time. So, you know, one sentence, it might be wages. The next sentence, it's earnings. The third sentence, it's remuneration. The fourth sentence, it's returns to labor. The fifth sentence, it might be net income. Yeah, you know, who knows what, you know, so, so the writer thinks, gee, every time I mention wages, I have to use a different word. So they keep coming up with more and more ridiculous, <laughs> you know, um, alternatives. And pretty soon the reader doesn't really understand what's going on anymore. So um, there's all kinds of variation that's going on in a piece of writing some of its words, some of its sentence structure, and on and on and on. The variation that we tend to think about is words, but that's really where you need to be the most careful. Um, and generally speaking, you want to use the same word for the same concept every time you use it, um, generally speaking. So that I wanted to get that in about variation. So let's go on to the, uh, the second uh, 
principle. Um, the other thing I want to say about these principles is if you're someone who, if your readers generally understand what you're, what you're saying, then keep doing what you're doing. Okay, don't do anything differently. If they understand what you're saying, then you're doing something right and just keep doing it. If they don't understand what you're saying, then, you know, maybe these principles will help you figure out why. So let's go on to the second one. Um, all right, here are two sentences. They both say roughly the same thing, but does one feel more abstract or dense or indirect than the other? Let me hear what you think about these two. Does one seem more dense or harder to read? So the first, A is, yep, the first sentence is dead. A is more indirect. That's exactly what I was hoping you would, you would, the conclusion you would make. So the question is why, okay? The question is why. So the previous principle had you look at subjects, grammatical subjects. This principle has you look at the verbs. Now, here's what I want you to notice. In sentence A, put my cursor here, there's a verb, it's was, okay? Um, there are also all these nouns that are really kind of noun forms of verbs, like opposition is the noun form of the verb to oppose. Failure is the noun form of the verb to fail. Projection is the noun form of the verb to project. Whereas you look at the second sentence, man, you've got three verbs that really kind of tell you what's going on in this sentence, right? Opposed, failed, project. Just looking at the verbs gives you a really good sense of, of the action that's taking place here. Um, and I have a little table here that you can, you can compare uh, the, the two lists here. Um, so what am I getting at here? <laughs> um, what I'm getting at here are words like opposition, failure, projection. They're known as nominalizations. And nominalizations are noun forms of verbs. And generally speaking, if you write with a lot of nominalizations, which academics often like to do, <laughs> Your, your writing can be really dense and indirect and difficult for a reader. Um, so I have here just a list of some examples of nominalizations and their, their verb forms. Um, so that brings me to principle number two, which is, oh, before I get to principle number two, a quotation from Williams and Visit about nominalizations and the effect that they can have on your writing. Um, you use a lot of these noun forms of verbs and your writing can really be difficult for a reader to get through. So the, the principle here is write with verbs, not nouns. That's the principle, write with verbs, not nouns. Um, uh, I'm not saying that the verb to be should never be used. I'm not saying that at all. There are plenty of times when the verb to be is the right verb to use. And in those situations, that's the verb you should use. I'm just saying, generally speaking, try to write with verbs, not with nouns. And a good test of this is what we just did. Take a passage, make a list of the verbs, do the verbs actually tell you what's going on in the passage? If they do, then you're on the right track. If they don't, you may not be, okay? You may be hiding a lot of actions in nouns rather than expressing them as verbs. So principle two is write with verbs, not with nouns. Christian. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I have once heard this uh, for, for German grammar that we have strong verbs and weaker verbs. And the weaker verbs are those that help other words or help nouns to do something. Um, and they are also not good for writing. Is this similar in, in English? It's it's similar, but not the same thing. So, I mean, we, we have, we call them linking verbs or helping verbs. Yeah, we have those. Um, it, it, that's not exactly what I'm getting at. What, what, what I'm getting at is that um, instead of expressing an action in a single word that is a verb, we will express action in a phrase that consists of a verb and a noun. So instead of saying, I assume, you have that single word that's a verb, you say, I make the assumption. All of a sudden, you've got three words instead of just one, and the verb is make, which I guess kind of says what's going on, but not as directly as assume, right? I mean, that's what I'm talking about here. Um, and this is not about passive and active verbs. That's a grammatical thing. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm just talking about as often as you can to use verbs not nouns. That's what I'm talking about here. Um, so let's look at this sentence, for example, um, which I did not include in your sample of sentences uh, because um, what I did include in your sample, I decided wasn't a good example. This is a better example. So here's, an, here's a sentence from a paper in Econometrica. And my question to you is, how many nominalizations can you identify? And what are those nominalizations? And remember, nominalizations are noun forms of verbs. So let me let me hear what you what you come up with here. So they begin per, they begin great. We study, okay? They got a subject, they got a verb. It's great. They begin, they're off on the right foot, but then <laughs> they slip into academies a little bit, right? Um, so uh, what are some of these nominalizations? Well, responses is the noun form of the verb respond. Let's see, there's a, ch there's a chat here. Diana has three. I'm not sure what that means. Um, change is a noun, but it's also a verb, but here they're using it as, as a noun. Regulation is a noun um, that has a verb form to regulate. So, so this sentence has at least three nominalizations in it. Um, and uh, let's play around with this and see, let's put this rule to the test, this principle to the test. And let's try to convert these nominalizations into verbs and see what we get, right? Um, so how do you do that? Well, the first step is, let me get my cursor here. Um, you convert the nominalizations into verbs, okay? So responses becomes respond. Change, it's still change, but it's a different function now. It's it change, in the sentence as a noun, we're going to use it as a verb. And regulation becomes regulate. So that's the first step. You convert these verbs into these nouns into verbs. And then what you find that you have to do is you have to come up with subjects for these verbs, right? Somebody or something is doing these actions, and you have to figure out who these things are or these people are. And sometimes they're in the sentence, but sometimes they're not. Um, so, you know, uh, the firms respond, that seems clear enough, okay, it's the firms who are responding. Who's implementing these changes? Is it the government? Is it unions? I don't know. I mean, I, I really don't know. Uh, let's say it's the government, though, okay, just for the sake of this example. Um, let's say it's the government. So what you might come up with is a sentence like this. We study how firms respond when the government changes apprenticeship regulation in Colombia. So we've converted two of those nominalizations to verbs. Um, and Williams and Bizzop and Gopin would say that this is a sentence that better 
expresses what you're really trying to communicate here. It's more direct. Um, the verbs tell you better what's going on, all that kind of stuff, right? The only verb in the first sentence was study. Here we got study, we got respond, we got change. Um, so you get a better sense at look, by looking at the verbs of what's going on in the sentence. But did we lose anything? Did we lose anything? Uh, we did. So this business about there being a large scale change is, is not in this revised sentence. So maybe that's important and we need to work it in. So what do we do? We go back to the drawing board, right? We come up with something else, maybe something like this. Um, we study how Colombian firms respond when the government regulates apprenticeships in entirely new ways. Okay, so now we got a sentence with no, um, as far as I can tell, no uh, nominalizations um, and three verbs that that um, uh, that give a sense of what's going on here. Uh, questions or comments about this? Now, I'm not saying never use nominalizations. I'm not saying that. Um, nominalizations can actually be very useful. And in some literatures and in some fields, they are such established terms that you would be crazy not to use them. Um, I'm just saying that in general, try to write with verbs, not with nouns. That's what I'm saying. Um, and if you do that, then I think you're gonna produce writing that is more direct and has a little more energy than a sentence with a lot of nominalizations. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back to that passage and I just want you to circle the verbs in that passage. And I want you to ask yourself, gee, do these verbs actually name what's going on in the sentence, really? Or am I kind of hiding what's going on in the sentence in nouns, in nominalizations? So take a few minutes and do this to the same passage and just see what you come up with. Um, if you find that your verbs are naming what's really going on, then you're doing great. If they don't, then you may think about revising, may. And then once you've done that, let's take a three minute break. Um, so let's, let's reconvene at exactly at, it's, it would be 12 noon, the top of the hour, which would be 12 noon my time. And then we'll finish up the present, we'll finish up the workshop. So finish circling your verbs, ask yourself, do they name the actions that are really happening? If so, great. If not, then look to see whether you're using a lot of nominalizations and if you can convert those to verbs. And then let's reconvene at, at uh, the top of the hour.
Okay, um, let's go ahead and reconvene and finish up the last half hour. Thank you for staying with me. Um, so putting principle one and principle two together, um, the basis of a clear writing style, at least in English, I don't know what it might be in other languages, is subject verb, grammatical subject that names your main character, followed immediately by a verb that states directly as possible, <laughs> i.e. in one word, <laughs> what the subject is doing. Um, that's, that's the basis of a clear writing style in English. Um, and if you can get this down, then you're, you're halfway home. Um, that, that's the basis of a clear style. Okay. Um, let's move on to the third principle. So again, I'm going to present you with two passages. And this time I want you to tell me which one, they both say the same thing, but which one flows better? Which one is better to kind of make sense of? Yep, B, I got a couple of votes for B. Um, yep, and that's that's what I was hoping you would say. So yeah, in my view, B flows better. Question is why? <laughs> and you maybe you can maybe you can spot this uh, immediately. But remember where I said when I said it's all about putting certain pieces of information in certain places. So um, what do you see in A is uh, Come here. is the piece of information that links the second sentence to the first sentence appears at the very end of the second sentence. So you have to read through all of that second sentence before you finally realize, oh, there's the connection. We're, we're hearing more about marital sorting. That's the connection. Whereas in B, that connection occurs at the very beginning of the sentence, right? At the very beginning, you immediately get a connection. You immediately see how the second sentence connects to the sentence that you just read. Okay. Um, Rudolph has a question. Yes, Rudolph. Sorry. Um... I thought that Marshall sorting was like written two times uh, as a one after the other, but I can't find it right now. So uh, my question is, um, I have no more questions, sorry. Okay, <laughs> okay. You thought you thought it was repeated or something? Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so, but okay. But anyway, that's why most people are gonna find B that, that B flows better because the piece of information that connects that second sentence with the first sentence occurs right at the beginning of that second sentence. That's why. So that brings us to the third principle, which is begin sentences with old information. Okay. What is old information? Old information is any word or phrase or term that the reader has heard before. It's any piece of information that the reader can kind of anticipate. Um, it's any piece of information that shows the logical connection. For, so for example, for example, or first or consequently, you know, words like that, that, that show the logical connection between two sentences. That's all old information. That all counts as old information. 
And this principle is really the key to creating flow. So, you know, a lot of times people will say, gee, the writing doesn't flow. What do they mean by this? Well, this is what they mean. They mean that they are having trouble seeing how the current sentence they're reading relates to or connects with the sentence that they just read. That's what they mean. And the, the remedy for that is to make that connection by putting old information at the beginning of that second sentence. And that's all, that's all we're talking about now. Is that right there? So if a reader can't follow you or complains that your writing doesn't flow, it's probably because with every sentence, you're directing their attention to something else and they're starting to get confused. Um, in other words, you're not starting these sentences with old information. Uh, and it, so that's what you need to do. You need to start sentences with old information so that your reader can immediately see how the sentence they're reading now relates to the sentence that they just read. Okay. Now these things accumulate. So you have a fuzzy connection between sentence one and se sentence two may not be a problem, may not. But then you have a fuzzy connection between two and three, and then one between three and four, and then pretty soon you've really got kind of a mess on your hands and your reader is having a really, really hard time. Really hard time. Same with nominalizations. The occasional nominalization, probably no problem. There are lots of nominalizations that are part of the normal lexicon of, of, a, of a discipline. Uh, but if you consistently use nominalizations when you don't really need to, rather than verbs, then your writing is going to start to feel really dense and difficult pretty soon. Um, I should say in this spirit, there's virtually, I can, I can pretty, other than being grammatically correct, <laughs> No rule of writing you have heard applies all the time. There's no such thing as a rule of writing that applies categorically in every situation. Um, there's just not. Um, it's all, it all depends on the circumstances, what you're trying to do, the context, all those kinds of things. Um, so uh, let's go back to our article from the American Economic Review where we looked at the the cars model. And let's look at the first two sentences and let's see how these authors did with starting that second sentence. Did they put old information at the beginning of that second sentence? Um, so the second sentence begins this concern. Okay. Have we heard that before? Have we seen that before? Yeah, we saw it in the first sentence. So these authors actually did pretty good. Um, they did what they were supposed to do. Now, did they know they were supposed to do that? Maybe, I don't know, but they did. <laughs> Their instincts were right at least. Um, so they began the second sentence with old information and that's good, that's good. They did a good job here. Now let's go back to this point I made about variation and how there's all kinds of variation. When we think of variation, we tend to think of variations in words and I said, that's the variation you probably should be most careful about. So here's an example. Let's say these authors thought, gee, I just used concern in the first sentence. I don't wanna use it again in the second sentence. Let's come up with a different word and vary our sentences. No, <laughs> they did the right thing by calling this a concern and sticking with that terminology. And that's what I encourage you to do. Um, they did the right thing here. Um, okay, um, questions or comments about beginning sentences with old information. All right, uh, so we got three principles so far, characters and subjects, write with verbs, not nouns, and begin with old information. Um, try for all three, try for all three, but if you can't do all three, principle three takes precedence. 
as long as your writing is coherent, cohesive, as long as your reader sees how it hangs together and can follow you, it doesn't matter what you're doing on the sentence level. You're doing, the, you're, you're, you're succeeding, okay? That's the main thing. Um, so try for all three, but if you had to do one instead of the other two, you wanna go for cohesion. You want your sentence, you want your writing to flow. Now, I would normally ask you to go back to your passage and um, underline the beginnings of your sentences, but we're running out of time, so I'm going to move on. But you can go back and later and do this after the workshop, okay? And of course, you're all going to go out and buy a copy of Williams and Bizip and read through it and work through it anyway. I know that. So, you know, you're going to do all that stuff. Uh, so let's move on to the next principle. Um, so here are three sentences. They say basically the same thing. Let me ask you, which one is the best sentence of these three? We have a vote in. All right, Diana says C, okay. A um, couple of folks, three folks say B. So B's getting some votes. Uh, someone's torn between A and C. Yeah, this is kind of a trick question. So um, whenever someone with no context says, is this a good sentence? As long as it's grammatically correct, but maybe even not then. There's only one answer to that question. And that answer is always it depends. Depends on the context, right? I mean, depends on who or what, for instance, is a sentence about. That is, who or what is the main character? That gets the principal one. What piece of information functions as old information? Is it in the right place? Like it's, we only know that from context. We can't, we don't know that from a single sentence. Um, and then what piece of information is new here? Or what piece of information really deserves the emphasis? Hmm. Well, um, that gets us at our fourth principle. So just as principle three said to begin with old information, Principle four is to end with new or what George Gopin calls stressworthy information, information that you want to emphasize. So the greatest place of emphasis in a sentence is at the end. Um, that's the greatest. It's not in the middle. Um, the beginning gets, gets some emphasis, but the end is, is, most people will tell you that the end is the place that gets the most emphasis. So Reserve the ends of your sentences for new or what Gopin calls stressworthy information, okay? You can think of a sentence as having two major parts, the old and the new. Um, the old is what connects the present sentence to the previous one. The new is why the sentence exists in the first place. It's to deliver information that your reader hasn't encountered before or can anticipate. That's that's what the new that's that's the that's generally the function of a sentence. It's to deliver new information. Um, but it it does that by first connecting to what's gone before, then it gives you the new information. So there's a principle of clarity that you should be aware of. Um, and and Williams and Bizup are really good on this discussion. Oh, first Gopin. Um, in his view, the biggest problem with most present day nonfiction, expository, academic writing, technical writing that he sees is this right here. The failure to put the most important information at the end of a sentence. And he's got this great sentence. It's like a sentence about 50 words long that he uses as an example. 
And the important information is in the middle of this sentence where no one's gonna notice it and where there's no way anyone would think it's important. And the only reason he knows it's important is because he asked the author. The author told him, well, that's the most important. Well, let's rewrite the sentence and put it at the end. It's a great discussion and a great example in Gopin's book. Um, so there's a general principle of clarity that you should be aware of, okay? Um, and it's this, basically readers, or if you're making a presentation, your audience, they generally like to go from the old to the new, the familiar to the unfamiliar, the simple to the complex, the easy to the difficult, okay? Remember how I explained constructing an argument, you first start with what everyone can agree on or what everyone may generally accept. That's the old, that's the familiar, that's the easy. You wanna start with that, get everybody around the table, get them all comfortable, you know, let them ease their way into your subject, and then you hit them with a complication. Then you hit them with the new, with the complicated, with the difficult, okay? That's what you wanna do. Um, so we can modify principle four. Uh, sort of an expanded version, um, end sentences with new or stressworthy or difficult complex information. And let me demonstrate what I mean, okay? Two sentences, which one is easier to read? Yep, getting votes for B, which is good. That's what I wanna see. Yeah, B, B is generally for most people easier to read, why? Well, first of all, A starts with two terms that you've probably never heard of before. Very long words that look weird. They got like a bracket in the middle of them and all this, I mean, it's strange looking, right? Whereas B, you start with information that people can kind of handle. You know, there's a temporal designation. People have heard of chemists. That's not going to give them any problem. And look what happens. Right after chemists, we have a verb, right? Terrific. Um, so B is going to be easier for those reasons because all the difficult stuff has been shoved to the end, right? It's been postponed. Let's start with the easy stuff. Then we'll get to the hard stuff. And look at A, too. You don't get to the verb have received until what three fourths of the way through the sentence. So, you know, you're still trying to process what you're being told before you even kind of know what's going on here. So for all those reasons, B is easier to to read. OK, because why the difficult information has been moved to the end. All right, let's deal. Let's 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 do the easy stuff first. Then we'll get to the hard stuff. Um, so. That brings up a little rule that you should know about. How do you handle or introduce jargon, right? This is a, this is a problem that we face when we want to communicate with a larger audience. Well, part, part, part of what you want to do is you want to define your terms, right? But it's not just about defining your terms. It's about where you introduce those terms. And what you want to do is you want to introduce jargon at the end of a sentence. Shift it to the right. That's what you want to do. Um, you also want to define it, but you want to shift it to the right. So the further you shift it to the right, the easier it is for the reader to handle. So let me introduce you to another very helpful phrase. Uh, this is our revised easy to hard. We can make it even easier by delaying the difficult information even more by, in, by adding a phrase like what are known as. Since the 1960s, chemists have paid long standing attention to what are known as, all right? So throwing that phrase in there delays the difficult information even more, but it also says to the reader, pay attention. I'm about to lay something on you that you probably haven't heard of before. And that can be very helpful. That can be a very helpful little device right there. So old to the new, familiar to the unfamiliar, easy to the difficult, simple to the complex. That's generally the way you want to go, okay? When you write, when you present, all those kinds of things. 
Um, okay. So again, if we had the time, I would ask you to go to your paragraph, but I know you're going to do this anyway after the workshop, so we're not going to do it right now. So let me just pause for a moment and see if there are any questions, and if there are not, I will review and wrap up. Hi, Paul. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, somebody else can go. Whoever's oh, please, speaking. Please go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to find out about a sentence length, because um, is that something that you need to be conscious of? Because I've seen uh, in a, a number of the examples that you've given, some of these sentences are long, even though they are constructed very well, they can sometimes they tend to be a little bit long. Is that something that we should worry about specifically for like if you want to publish? Do they mind so much as um, or does it not matter in the context of as long as it's clear and they're following? That's what I'd like to find out. So in my view, Thanks. it doesn't matter as long as it's clear from the context. Um, Gopin is very good on sentence length, by the way. So a lot of writing guys will tell you, and I've seen this, they'll tell you write short sentences. I mean, that's just ridiculous. I mean, you write this, the sentences need to be as long as they need to be long. I mean, if you just write short sentences, your writing will be monotonous. And how are you going to handle complicated ideas that involve, you know, subordination and coordination and, and, and trying to make grammatical connections between ideas? You can't do that with just short sentences. Now, having said that, Back to variety, one source of variety is sentence length. So the occasional very short sentence in the midst of three or four long sentences can really pack a punch. I mean, that can really emphasize a point. Um, so, you know, think, of, think about it that way. Um, but yeah, uh, Diana, thank you for that question, Diana. Yes, thank you. I jump on it because I'm not uh, an English native. So do you have some advice? Uh, like since you say, like all my professors say, make it shorter, no? It's the, you make the points uh, if it's uh, shorter, but do you have some advice for people who does not uh, speak English as well as, as native people? So the, the way that I answer that is, it's not, it, it, it has less to do with your non-native situation than you might believe. Lots of native English speakers have the same problems writing. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the only advice I can give is if you're, if you're determined to write better in English is to just keep working at it. Read really good writing, which is something academics not all, they don't always do. They, they tend to just read other academics. And so, you know, read some of our best essayists and start to, or some of our best novelists and start to, you know, somehow get a good sense in your mind of what good writing sounds like. So your advice is to read other things that academic uh, writing write. Well, my, my advice is how do people learn how do people learn how to write well? There's basically two ways. They read a lot of good writing and they get a lot of good feedback on their drafts. That's basically how you learn to write. There's no shortcut. Um, there's there's no other way I know of other than those ways. Um, and I think that that's the advice for whether you're a non-native speaker or a native speaker. Having said that. The, the, the Swales and Feek book that I mentioned earlier, the early editions of that book were actually targeted at non-native speakers. And so you might find their book very helpful because it's, it's sort of coming from that place, even though it's no longer marketed that way. Um, so you might find their book, find their book helpful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know enough about other languages to to know, um, you know, to know like, okay, if you're used to writing in, you know, Japanese uh, or Italian, 
how that might affect your writing in English. I just don't know enough about, I would like to know more about that, but I don't know enough about that. Um, there is a, an article, we're running out of time. There, there's an article by a famous writing teacher named William Zinzer. I'm going to put this in the, uh, it's, is it SSER? And it's something about, oh gosh, um, it's in the American Scholar, and it's about writing in English. What makes for good writing? I think if you if you search for this, you will find an article where this guy named William Zinzer, um, and I think it's one and two S's. Um, he he begins by talking about. He says, "Well, you know, my students ask me what makes for good writing, and I answer, well, what language are you writing in? If you're writing in this language, this is good writing. If if you're writing in this language, that's good writing. If you're writing in English." Here's what I think good writing is. So you might you might find something like that helpful. Okay, someone asked about passive voice. Uh, another bad piece of advice you get is never use the passive voice. That's a bad piece of advice. Uh, the passive voice, as Gopin and Williams are very good on, is extremely useful for lots of things. Uh, it's very useful for getting certain words at the beginning of a sentence, for example. It's very useful if you can't or don't want to show agency. Um, there's lots of there's lots of reasons, and just to categorically avoid the passive voice is bad advice. Let me give you an example. George Orwell, probably my favorite writer, he's got a very famous article called Politics in the English Language. At the end of the article, he's got a list of rules. One of the rules is don't use the passive voice. Okay, his most famous article is shooting an elephant. That article begins with a passive voice sentence. I was hated by, that's how it begins. So he breaks his own rule, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, the passive has useful purposes. Use the passive when you need to use the passive. So let me go to a review real quick. Um, okay, uh, master the cars model. Create a research space, identify a gap, fill the gap or solve the problem. Once you master the model, you can then vary it for your own particular purposes, okay? Um, but it's a good model to master. Remember the four principles, characters as subjects, write with verbs, not nouns, begin with the old and with the new, okay? Um, organizing principle of clarity, old to new, familiar to unfamiliar, Simple to complex, easy to difficult. Uh, writing is a lifelong pursuit. Think of it that way. Think of this as something that, that is part of your professional identity to work on and get better on as you move throughout your career. Um, remember, you are not alone. Everybody struggles with this. Everybody. Every single person. They all struggle with it. And then finally, again, I want you to be kind and gentle to yourself. Be your own best friend. So thank you so much for attending. Um, I can hang around for a few more minutes if there are any questions. Um, happy to do that. Paul, I have one more question. And there was, yep. um, first of all, thanks so much for, for everything. I think maybe those who are sticking around uh, can also discuss how and if we should uh, do or 